Good morning, Alamo City. God is great and he is worthy to be praised. Amen. Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou. I think we're trying to get a video to roll up for our welcome, uh, but until then, I'm just going to welcome you, so we're good. All right. 
We just want to welcome you to Alamo City Church. Uh, if you're watching here or if you're watching online, we want to let you know that the Lord loves you and you are blessed this morning. And if you're looking at your neighbor this morning and you just want to tell them hi or give them a, a hug or a handshake, just tell them that they're welcome this morning. Tell them it's good to see you because we all need to know that we are wanted and we are in the house of the Lord and there's an abundance of, Lord, of love in this place. And uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on with our worship. Amen. Your mercy endureth forever. Come on, tell that circumstance. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship. Forever, people from. 
He's good, and his mercy endureth forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, if he's been so good, we need to testify. We need to tell somebody. We need to tell him, hey, you know, I don't have it all together. I don't know everything, but I do know one thing. And I know that Jesus Christ is good, and he never fails us. He's always good. He always loves us. That's a testimony right there. Amen. Where I'll be left on 
now I see glory, glory. this is your first time at church, I just want to warn you, we get kind of crazy about Jesus and uh, we just love to praise him. And if you're wondering why they're so crazy, it's because we serve a God who loves us with this ridiculous love that he would chase after us. And even when we're saying, no, I don't, I don't want any of that, I don't want any of that. But this God that we, that we come to love and adore, he has come down in flesh and he has given his life that we may have life and life more abundantly. He's the God who leaves the 99 sheep and chases after the one. And if you know what it's like to be that one, <laughs> you got something to testify about because he saved us and he continues to love us throughout our lives. He's so good. Just try Jesus. Sing me. 
you've been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. your foe, still your love fought for me, you have been so, so good to me, when I felt no worth, you paid it all for me, you have been so, so No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Yeah. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Yeah. There's no
for the love of Jesus. My God, where would we be without the, the grace of our Savior? If you know, then you know, amen. His love comes after us. But there's another part of that. It's a two-way street. And falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. Amen.
see I've tried it for myself and I know There's no place I'd rather, rather Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. God bless you, Alamo City family. Greetings to those of you in the name of Jesus who are in the building in San Antonio, 6500 I-835 North. And greetings to all of you who are part of our streaming family scattered across Texas, scattered across the United States, and to some degree even scattered across the world. It is my joy and privilege today to introduce to you one of my favorite preachers. Whenever Sammy Tippett is lined up to speak somewhere or there is an announcement going out that Sammy will be invited to a particular meeting or particular gathering, I want to be there. I want to hear what the man has to say. Shirley and I have known Sammy and Tex for well over 30 years. We have watched them, we have walked with them, we have prayed for them, and many of you of the Alamo City family, you know exactly what I'm talking about, the tough places of the world where Sammy would be sent to lift up the name of Jesus. He's one of those that the scripture speaks of who has risked his life for the cause of Christ. And those are ones who were to be given double honor. So I want to encourage you this morning to open your heart Pray as Sammy begins, Lord, speak to me. He is a man who understands revival, who who has seen it in Romania and other places. God bringing amazing breakthroughs. You need a breakthrough maybe in your life, maybe in the situation that you're in the middle of. We need a revival. We need a breakthrough in the United States of America. And I believe Sammy has something to say. Fresh from the heart of the Lord, So open your heart, open your spirits, and let the Lord speak to you. God bless you, Sammy, now as you come. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor David, and it is a joy to be here with you this morning. I am so excited about it uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm excited because I just love to come and be able to speak in my own home church I come Sunday after Sunday, and I minister to just as you are, and that is such a blessing for me to be able to come and speak to you. But there's a second reason, and I shared this with Pastor David, and and that is that God has put something on my heart that uh, actually we're beginning to launch, and I want to share it with you. I want to share the scripture with you. I want to share what God has placed on my heart, and, and really let this be the launching pad. And one of the reasons this is the launching pad is because Uh, There are people from Alamo City who have really been a part of helping me to do this, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. But let me share with you what God's put on my heart before I speak uh, to launch. And uh, and, and that is that, uh, as Pastor David said, we desperately need revival in our nation. We need a move of God's Spirit, and Pastor David's been speaking about that. And God has been placing this on my heart for for a long time. And back in December, I went to, uh, right before Christmas, I went to a movie, uh, The Chosen, at one of the theaters, and I saw something that gripped my heart. There were four dramatic monologues that were given there on the names of God. And when I saw that, I came out of the theater and there was just something burning in my heart. Sammy, you have to do that. And uh, to be honest with you, I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> I just knew I needed to do what I saw. And, and I said, Lord, that's impossible. And one of the things in, in my life that, that I've discovered is that God often calls us to the impossible because only He can make it possible. And, and I didn't know what it was, and over time I came to discover what it was, and that was to issue a call for prayer 
in our nation, to issue a challenge to pray. And I didn't know how to do that. I, I looked and I saw what they did at the, uh, on, you know, at the Chosen, and I said, Lord, I can't do that. I don't have a production studio. I don't have a production company. I, I do some videos, you know, but with my, with my cell phone and that I put on Facebook and stuff, and, and we've d- done some of that. But, Lord, I don't have that kind of expertise. I don't have that kind of, you know, anything. And, and there was music background. I know nothing about music. And I said, Lord, if, if you want me to do this, if you want me to issue this call to pray, then, then you're going to have to put this together. And, and I just began to pray about it. And that was, uh, that was on December 10th when I went to that movie. I don't know when it was, Josh, but around the 1st of January, or right around the 1st of January, Josh sent me an email. And he said, Sammy, I've done this composition for a dramatic monologue, and I want you to watch it. <laughs> it really wasn't a Christian thing. It was a secular thing. And, but he had composed some music for this monologue. And so I watched it, and I was blown away with what God, the gift that God has placed in Josh. And, and I said, Lord, I, I, I sent Josh an email. I said, hey, can, can we meet for coffee or something? I need to talk to you. And so we met for coffee and about a week later, and I shared with him what God was stirring in my heart. And what he was putting on my heart, I said, but I don't know where to begin. All I know is, you know, there needs to be a script written. There needs to be someone to present it. And I said, I don't have actors and stuff like that. All I know is what's on my heart. And I said, I can write a script and I can present what's on my heart, but there needs to be music. That's the next key element to it. And then there needs to be video and all this. And he said, well, Sammy, I'm in with you. And and boy, it just, it blew me away. And he says, I'll work with you on this. And I said, well, I'm not talking about one video. I'm talking about creating a series that will touch hearts. And he says, I'm in. And I, 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 I went home. I just thanked the Lord said, thank you, Jesus. And, then he, and I asked him also, I said, well, look, I don't even know if I, all I have is my cell phone. I don't know if what I have, I have a little room in my home where I film these these videos that I do in a green screen behind me can someone come and look at that and he said I'll get someone he got Izzy to come over <laughs> and uh, and Izzy came over and and so from here in, in our church and then they put together a team to look and see what I needed and and then a, a, a team to edit and film and and we put together a series of taking the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray 13 phrases, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we went one by one, those, and I created a dramatic monologue illustrating what, what that meant in real life and how we pray that. And so Josh began to work with me, and I, I won't tell you what, I've just, it's just blown me away at how God has gifted him in the heart that he has for this. Josh, would you come up here and, and just take a minute and just share from your heart uh, what, what is happening with this, and then I want to share with everybody how they can be a part. Well, good morning, Alamo City. How are we doing? It's great to see all of you this morning. I want to welcome our in-person family and our streaming family this morning as well. Just so grateful that you joined us. Um, and uh, when I was asked by Sammy to, to write the music for this 13-day prayer challenge uh, based on the Our Father prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, I was immediately intrigued and very interested. And I wanted to learn more about this video series And about the vision that God has put uh, upon Sammy. It's not every day that I'm invited to write the music for a video series based on the model prayer. And so I recognized a great sense of purpose and also a great responsibility to do all that I could to try to help to bring this project to life. And as we're nearing the end of working on this particular collection, I can tell you without a doubt that this 13-day prayer challenge is a unique, exciting, 
emotional, creative, and refreshingly original presentation. As each video centers around a phrase from the model prayer, it's truly like shining a light onto each of these phrases and, and diving into each experience that's presented. My hope is that the music contributes to an all-engaging and an all-immersive experience into the model prayer. I truly want to thank Sammy for the amazing honor that it's been to write the score for the 13-day prayer challenge. And I also want to encourage uh, each of our in-person and streaming family. If you're looking for an exciting addition to your prayer life, maybe you pray the same way every day. Maybe you've lost a little bit of that connection or a little bit of that perspective that you used to have. Um, and you'd like to experience the Our Father prayer in a new, exciting, and unique way. Please check out the 13-Day Prayer Challenge by Sammy Tippett. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to ask you to put up on the screen real quick the QR code, if you could. And uh, I'm going to give you permission to do something and even ask you to do. take out your phone and take a picture of that. And uh, this will tell you where you can sign up to receive this. Everything's free. And there's no cost. We're not selling anything. Everything's free. Take a, take a picture of it and you'll have that QR code will take you to where you can sign up for the, uh, for the prayer challenge. Also, right under it is the uh, address where the web address, you can just type it in on your computer and you'll be able to go directly to it. Now, we'll show it again at the end of the service, but I wanted to just give you that opportunity to do it. It'll be 13 days. We'll, we'll start releasing it on August 22nd, and for 13 days, every day, you will receive an email with that video and some instructions on how to pray. And, and I believe that if we will pray the way Jesus taught us to pray, we will see God do extraordinary things. And there's a reason for that. And that is <laughs> the Word of God says that if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, we know that we have the petitions we desired of Him. And I know that what Jesus taught us to pray is the will of of the Father. So I know God's going to answer it. Now I'm going to speak to you this morning on my early journey into praying through the, the, the model prayer and, and how God set me on a journey. And so I'm going to read to you the scripture first of all. I'm going to read to you the word of God uh, and, and just take that passage of scripture and read to you. And then after that, you're going to see the very first of these videos, these dramatic monologues, and at the end you'll see the very last one. But before we do that, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 6 and verses 9 through 13. Now, I have to tell you, there's only one page in my Bible, and it's hard for me because the go-to page I have in my Bible that's torn up now, it's the only page torn up in my Bible, is Matthew 6. Uh, because I've gone to it so much, it has been what, what has just burned in my heart. So I'm going to read from, from my phone here because it's, it's hard for me to read from my Bible there. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want us to see the first phrase that we've illustrated right now, our Father. Fear filled her beautiful blue eyes as they pled. Help me, Daddy. Please help me. Tears trickled down her face. Daddy, I don't want to die. Don't worry, sweetheart. It'll be okay. I tried to assure her, but it was impossible. I felt helpless. My heart broke. 
guilt ran through my veins like a runaway freight train. I felt like a failure as a father. I brought my family to Romania, a communist country, to tell people about Jesus. And I told myself, God will take care of us. Now, my sweet little Renee was in danger. She had been hit by an automobile while crossing the street. I rode in the ambulance with her to the hospital while my wife, Tex, filled out the police report. Our team would bring Tex to the hospital as soon as she had finished. Christians were persecuted severely in Romania during that time, and many were afraid of hospitals because there had been instances when followers of Jesus went into a hospital with an ailment, but they died from something else. I had been warned to be careful, but I would be with Renee every second. I was her father. I wouldn't let anything happen. They took x-rays, did all the medical tests, and I was with her. But where was Tex? It had been 30 minutes since we left her, then an hour, two hours. Where was she? Had something happened? When she finally arrived, she grabbed Renee's hands and gave her the comfort that only a mother can give a daughter. But I could tell something was wrong. I pulled her aside and I said, what's going on? The police said that I was at fault. They said that I should never have let Renee get away from me. They took my passport and told me that I would go to prison. I covered my face as my head fell. What have I done? Tex lifted my chin. Sammy, it's time for the service to begin. You have to go to the church and preach. I can't. No, I can't. I'm staying here with Renee, with you. She gently placed her hands on my cheeks. We came here to tell people about Jesus. You must go. I will stay with Renee. She'll be okay. But I'm her father. I can't leave. Texas' big brown eyes pierced my heart. You must go. Our Father will take care of us. Now, go. Everyone was anxious when I arrived at the pastor's office. The church was packed with people who had come to find hope in a very dark place. The pastor and two of my Romanian friends embraced me. No one spoke. Silence. Finally, with tears rolling down my face, told them, I can't do this. I can't preach. My heart is too heavy. All of us fell to our knees, weeping. Strangely, a presence filled the room, the Father's presence. I wept. Father! 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 I don't understand it. Flooded my soul, a peace that was beyond comprehension. I rose and we entered the sanctuary. People who had been taught atheism all of their lives listened intently to the message about a God who loved and cared about them. Many responded, and I prayed with them. As I opened my eyes, a note was on the pulpit. It was from Tex. Sammy, Renee is okay. He has been released from the hospital. We're back at the hotel. The police have given me my passport. Our Father is perfect in His goodness. In that moment, wave after wave of the love and goodness of our Father poured over my soul. I rushed to the hotel and embraced my two girls. What joy! Before I went to bed that night, I gazed at the stars and whispered, Father, Father, Father. I experienced a depth of prayer that I had never known. You see, I entered into the presence of God by worshiping him as our father. I understand.
understood why Jesus taught the disciples to open the door of prayer by looking to our Father. Our Father. The word Father is a term that's dear. It's a familial term. And Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, he wanted us to know that he is near and he is dear to us. He loves us. He is our Father. And if you read through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you'll discover that he continued talking about the, the relationship that we have with God in prayer as our Father. He said to the disciples, if you, as earthly fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give that which is good to his children? He is our Father. Now, there's something you, you need to understand about this, and I want to share with you a little of my journey in prayer because I didn't know it, but in, in the very beginning of my Christian walk and Christian life, God began to teach me these truths. And by the way, what Jesus taught his disciples to pray were, was not just some remote thing or rote thing that we're to memorize and to repeat for Jesus told his disciples right before he taught them to pray this he said don't use vainless repetition in other words don't just repeat something without having any meaning to it he, he said this this must be in you and what I discovered and and is that these are truths truths that Jesus was teaching us about our relationship with prayer. Let me give you a definition of what prayer is. And this is not unique with me or originally from me, but a dear friend of mine shared this with me, and I like it. It's the best definition I've ever heard. He said, it is the communication piece of a love relationship with God. It is the communication piece of a love relationship with God. If that love relationship is not there the communication piece will not be there. And if the communication piece is not there, the love relationship will not grow. Every great relationship in life is built upon communication. And it's two-way communication, not just one way. You see, God has given us his word. This book is God's love letter to us. And he speaks to us. We don't read the Bible out of obligation or out of religious duty. This book is God's word. I remember when my wife and I first uh, met and we, we were going to two different schools and, and we were going to be married and, oh, I was so in love with her. And, and every day she would write me a letter. And you know what I did every day? The first thing I did when I got up was I went to the post office to read all of those sweet things she had to say to me. And, and this is what the Bible is. It's God's love letter to you. It's God's love letter to me. And he wants to speak to us. He wants to communicate with us who he is and what he does and how he works and his nature and his character. And, and then we get to come to him. And, and there's some truths that God has, has shown us. And in the first three phrases, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Those truths show us the nature and the character of God. And I don't believe it's any accident that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, that he taught them to open the door of prayer with their focus on who God is. In fact, in another passage, a parallel passage over in Luke, the disciples said to Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And you know, I find that very interesting because, you know, they, they could have asked him a lot of things. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him work miracles. They saw him cast out demons. 
They, they saw him do all kinds of miracles, but they didn't say, Lord, teach us to heal the sick. Lord, teach us to raise the dead. Lord, teach us to do miracles. No, they didn't ask any of those things. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Because they saw something in him. They saw something in him that was so powerful, and they saw it grew out of prayer. They would be asleep. He would be praying. And so they knew. They knew that the secret of his life as a man, now he was all God and he was all man, but you see, as God he didn't need to pray, but he showed us how to live as a man, and he taught us how to live, and so he prayed, and he sought the Father. And, and, and we find that what they asked him when they said, Lord, teach us to pray, is very similar to what he taught in Matthew chapter 6. And in both places, we find that he opens the door of prayer with the focus on who God is. You see, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and we enter into his courts with praise. And when you see him for who he is, you will come into his presence worshiping him. And, and what, what problems we have in prayer so often is built around the fact that we come in and we say, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, I need this. And kind of prayer is like a get out of jail free card when we're in trouble. Now, let me tell you what. <laughs> God has gotten me out of jail a lot of times. But that's not what prayer is. Yes, he wants us when we're in trouble to come to him. But you see, we, he wants us to get to know him as our Father, the one who loves us. And you see, what I was trying to illustrate in this video was simply this. As a father, I love my daughter. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. But I am limited. As much as I love them, there are things that I cannot do for them. But our Father, our Father is the creator of the universe. He is not only our Father, He is our Father in heaven, seated upon the throne. All authority and all power belong to Him. And not only that, He is in a category all His own. He is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There is none like Him. And so we come into His presence and we worship him for who he is. Oh, I tell you what, before I came to know Christ, all prayer was was this get out of jail free card for me. And when I'd get in trouble, I'd go to him. But one night in a church, I remember as a university student at LSU, something happened that changed everything. That night, I heard a man talk about Jesus. And he said that Jesus loved me and died for me, that that was not just some historical thing that happened 2,000 years ago, but that it was relevant for my heart and for my life today. And he said, if you want to know Jesus, you can have Jesus in your life. And that night I went to the front of that church and I knelt and I prayed and I opened my heart to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, come into my life. I don't remember the words I said, but I just opened my life. I put my faith in him. And a miracle happened. A miracle happened. All the guilt that I was carrying fell off of me. And oh, I, 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 I was free from all of that guilt. But there was a greater miracle that took place that I didn't even realize, that I didn't understand at that time, that I had no idea. And that was the God who is absolute purity, the God who is totally holy, the God who I could never approach. That God, the 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 the, the curtain that divided me from that holy God was ripped in two. And I, as a sinner, because of God's grace, because of what Christ did, I could now come into his presence. And, and you know, no one taught me this, but two friends of mine and I started meeting at the state capitol. I, I was born and raised in Baton Rouge. I was a freshman at LSU when I came to know Christ. And and we started meeting that Baton Rouge is the state capitol. And the, the capitol building looks like a, a big, large candle. And, and right next to the state capitol is this hill. And it overlooks a lake. On the other side of the lake was the hospital where I was born. And, and we would go to that hill 
on that right next to the lake and right next to the state capitol building. And we would, we would meet with the Lord. And we would go and, 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 you know, I didn't even have a whole Bible at that time. All I had was a New Testament and someone had given me. And so I took that New Testament and I just began to read the Bible. And we would, we would separate the three of us when we would get there early in the morning. And, and we would read the Bible and then we would come back and, and talk about it and what, what God had spoken to our hearts. And then we would talk to God and we would pray. And then we'd go get along and then we'd talk to God more. But, oh, I want to tell you what, those days were filled with Worship. Worship. When I realized our Father, who is in heaven, who is holy, who is absolute purity, bid me to come into his presence, that no one ever loved me like he loved me, and I could come into his presence, and I could know him and love him and worship him. I remember one night, I heard a song about how he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. And I just began to thank Jesus. I just began to worship Jesus. And I said, I'm going to go out to the lake, and I'm just going to spend some time worshiping him. And I went out to the lake, and and I went out on a pier over the lake, and I just began to tell Jesus, I love you. I love you, Lord. You love you love me like no one ever loved me before. You are our Father. You are Almighty God on your throne. You are holy. And I began to worship him, and I fell in the lake. <laughs> and I was all wet, and I looked up, and I said, I still love you. <laughs> I tell you what, there was something that happened. I was, I was crazy, but listen, I was crazy in love with Jesus. Oh, you see, I learned early in my Christian life. No one taught it to me, but I learned. I learned to look to God in worship. And something happened when I began to worship God. He began to orchestrate events and people in my life. That, that I would be able to pray the next part of the prayer. The truth, the next truth. You see, as you get to see him for who he is, you see what's on his heart. And what is on his heart? The world, the world, the world is on the heart of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Oh, God loves the world. And when you see him, listen, when you read this book from beginning to end, it's all about the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life. They are those which testify of me. Listen, this book is about Jesus from beginning to end. It points us to Jesus, the person of Jesus Christ. And you see his great love, the whole reason he came to this earth was he came because you and I and all men and women are separated from a holy God, from the creator of the universe. And you see the mighty love of God that he would take upon himself human flesh, that he would suffer, that he would die for you, for me. And oh, you know what happens? You begin to feel what's on his heart. And you begin to pray what's on his heart. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that begs the question, what is his kingdom? Where is his kingdom? The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's a relationship that produces righteous living, peace in your heart with God and with your fellow man and joy in your life. And so what we pray for when we pray for the kingdom of God to come, we pray for the king of love who is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords to come and rule in the hearts of people. And we begin to pray for people, not out of judgmentalism, but out of a compassion and a love that the Father has for all people. And we pray for them. I'll never forget Not long after I came to know Christ, God brought a man across my path by the name of Leo Humphrey. He worked in the French quarters of New Orleans, and Leo Leo loved people that nobody else loved. He would go down to the biker gangs, the drug addicts, the runaways, the people that nobody else cared about, 
and he'd put his arm around them and he would share the love of Jesus with them. And I'll never forget praying with Leo. And you see, this is where I learned to pray this great truth. I, re- I remember praying in a coffee house there in, in the French quarters of New Orleans. Leo and I on our faces before God on the floor praying, crying out to God. And I, I remember Leo's face was filled with tears falling from his eyes. And as those tears dropped to the floor, as he prayed for bikers by name, as he prayed for gang members by name, as he prayed for drug addicts by name, he wept for them. And oh, I saw, I saw the truth of praying your kingdom come, your will be done, for it's God's will that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And my heart began to break, and I began to pray, not just rote memory, your kingdom come, your will be done, come, O oh kingdom. Oh, no, that wasn't from Rome. I began to pray from my heart for people. God sent my wife and I, after being with Leo for some time, God sent us to Chicago. As I saw how Leo loved people, and God put that, that second truth, that, that second truth from worship to praying for others in my heart. God sent us to Chicago. I said, Lord, send me somewhere where it's dark, where there's no hope. Send me somewhere to bring the good news of your love to people. And he put it on my heart, and Tex and I moved to the highest crime rate area of the city of Chicago. We didn't have anything. (laughs) We loaded everything we had in a small U-Haul trailer. And we drove to the highest crime rate area, rented a big house right in the middle of all the crime in Chicago, and we moved in. And you know what I discovered? I discovered the third truth. Give us this day our daily bread. That God will meet every need. If if we know him, we love him, and we are worshiping him. And, 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 And that's the goal of our hearts. We come into his presence worshiping him, and we have a heart for people, and we put our lives and say, Lord, I want your kingdom to come. I want your will to be done. And we begin to pray for people from the heart of God with what's on his heart for his rule and reign in their lives, for his will to be done. Oh, when we begin to pray for that, God will meet every need that we have through Christ Jesus. When my wife and I got married, or when I asked her father for her hand in marriage, the first question he asked me, he says, how are you going to provide for my daughter? And I said, well, God's called me to preach. And his next question was, do you have a place to preach, a church? And I said, no, sir, but God will provide. (laughs) He must have thought I was crazy, but he was a very gracious man, and he gave us permission to be married, and we were married. And I told Tex, I said, sweetheart, I can't promise you that we'll ever be rich, but I promise you this, life of Jesus and me won't be boring. And it certainly has not been boring. And we moved into the highest crime rate area of the city of Chicago, and God met every need that we had. And for 50 years, we've lived by faith, we've served by faith, we've worked by faith, and God has been faithful. He is Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. And we learned this third great truth. And so when we moved into Chicago, into this high crime rate area of the city, we began to minister. We'd go out on the streets and share Jesus. God began to move in the city. God worked in a mighty way. In fact, the Chicago Tribune did a a front-page article four days in a row on the Jesus movement in Chicago. And we were called the leaders of the Jesus movement there because we were reaching young people that nobody else was reaching. They had on the front page a full-color photo of me baptizing in Lake Michigan. God moved and God worked. And so our our team grew. We we had a team of 13 full-time workers working with us. And what we would do is I had learned very early in, in, in my Christian life when I came to know Christ that we met with these guys and God began to teach me these truths, to pray these truths. Even though I didn't know the words, I was praying the truths. 
And, and so I had, I had learned to pray, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. I had learned to come into his presence with worship and thanksgiving and praise. I had learned to pray for others. I had learned that he would meet our every need. And so what I did was I said, Okay, guys, every morning before we do anything with our work, we're going to meet together and we're going to pray together. And we, we did. So we, we, we started praying together. So what we would do is we would meet together, the 13 all workers, we would all meet together, and, and we would just worship Jesus. And then after we would worship Jesus, every morning, we would pick one country, one country, and we would pray for that country. And so one morning, we picked West Germany, and at that time, Germany was two countries. West Germany was free, East Germany was communist. So we pr- picked West Germany, and we said, let's pray for God's kingdom to come. God's will to be done in Germany as it is in heaven. Let's pray for the kingdom of God to come. So we begin to pray that morning. And do you know what happened? The love of the Father flooded that prayer meeting. And God broke our hearts and we wept and we extended the prayer time. And then finally when the prayer time ended, everybody left except for two, me and one one of my colleagues. And we said, we've got to keep praying for Germany. I don't know why. I don't know anything about Germany. I don't know anyone in Germany. I just know we need to pray for the kingdom of God to come, the will of God to be done. And we prayed for the kingdom of God, the will of God. We prayed all day. We prayed into the night. And finally I told Murray, I said, Murray, We've got to get a hold of someone. We started looking. We found some phone numbers of of English-speaking missionaries living in Germany. And so I just took, I I called, and it was very expensive during those days. It wasn't like what we have today. It was very expensive to do that. And I called over to Germany to this pastor, and I said to him, I said, Pastor, we were having a prayer meeting this morning, and God spoke to my heart. And, and just put Germany on my heart. And I feel like I need to come there and preach the gospel. And the pastor laughed. And he said, well, do you know anybody here? I said, no, sir. He said, do you speak German? I said, no, sir. He said, well, this sounds foolish to me. I said, I know it does. It sounds foolish to me too. But I'm just trying to obey God. My heart's breaking for the German people. And I don't know what to do. He said, well, you just keep praying. I said, thank you. I hung up. Two weeks later, I received a letter in the mail from this pastor. He said, Dear Sammy, he said, "Uh, I didn't know who you were, but right after we got off the phone, the next day in our German newspapers, there was an article about your ministry in Chicago. And he said, Would you come to Germany and speak to our pastor's conference? I said, Hallelujah. God is Jehovah Jireh. He meets our every single need. Not long after that, my wife and I got on a flight. It wasn't international flying like it is today. We got on a flight to Germany. We flew to Frankfurt, Germany. We had to change planes to go to Munich. We were changing planes, and there was this dear praying couple, these ladies praying ladies who came to us and gave us a little diaper bag that folded out into a baby bed and Dave our son had just been born he was just a couple months old and we put him in that little diaper bag and carried him with us to Germany and so when we got to Munich we were all tired and and Tex said to me said Sammy would, would you take Dave and we call him Davey at the time he said would you take Davey and and I took took him and and I heard this German voice say Sammy Sammy are you Sammy Tippett <laughs> we just landed in Germany. I said, yes, I am, but who are you? He says, my name is Volkart Spitzer. I said, okay, <laughs> who's Volkart Spitzer? And he says, I'm a pastor in Berlin. And he says, what are you doing here? I said, well, how did you know who I was? He said, well, our church, a man came to our church a few weeks ago and asked us to pray for Sammy Tippett. And we've been praying every day for Sammy Tippett in Chicago. And I heard this American girl say, Sammy, take the baby. And I just wondered if it might be Sammy Tippett. (laughs) I said, no, I can't believe this. I said, yes. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to speak at this pastor's conference. He says, "Are, are you coming to preach in Berlin? I said, no, I don't know anyone in Berlin. He said, yes, you do, me. I said, okay. He says, 
what, what are you doing? He said, I, I said, I'm flying down to Munich. He said, you on this flight? I said, yes. He said, I am too. And he began to shout, hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, what, what's, what's so exciting about this flight? He said, I was supposed to fly from Berlin to, directly to Munich, and our flight got changed, and I was rerouted to Frankfurt, and I changed planes, and I'm on this flight. Let's sit together on the plane. I sat together on the plane. And the reason I'm telling you this story is I preached at his church every night, and Tex and I would go to the Berlin Wall, and it was like a big, a big prison yard. Every 200 meters, there was a machine gun tower. And, and we would pray, oh, God, somehow move and work. Oh, God, I pray for your glory, your kingdom to come, your will to be done. But the ultimate of, 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 of the prayer that Jesus taught, the final place, the, the goal of all praying that Jesus taught was that his is the kingdom, his is the power, and his is the glory. And that's what we pray for. We pray for his kingdom, his power, and his glory. And my wife and I would go to the Berlin Wall every night after the service. And there you could see these machine gun towers. And we would pray, oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus that your kingdom would come. That Lord, we would see your power displayed in East, East Germany, East Berlin. I pray for your glory. And so I asked the pastor of the church, Volkart, I said, Pastor, do you know anyone in East Berlin? He says, I have some of the people in our church that know some people in East Berlin. And they told me about an old German Lutheran pastor who lived in East Berlin who was arrested by Hitler because he refused to heil Hitler and the communists wouldn't let him preach. And so uh, he, he said, you, you might want to talk to him. So they gave us his address. And Tex and I went got a 24-hour visa into East Berlin to the Communist Park, and we went in there, and we met this old man. And I'll never forget what the old man said to me. He looked, and he could tell, he could tell that I had been with the Lord. And he said this. He said, next year, there are going to be 100,000 communist youth who will gather here in East Berlin to be trained to win the world to communism and atheism. And I want you to pray about coming and preaching the gospel to them. I said, Pastor, that would be impossible. He said, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You pray. You pray. Well, I pray, and I don't have time to tell you. I was going to tell the whole story, but I've gone too long already. But I'll tell you what happened. We went in there, Fred, two, two other friends of mine, Fred Bishop and Fred Starkweather and I, went in to East Berlin during this Communist Youth World Fest. We would spend the mornings Tex with Tex and Davey, our son, and we would pray in the morning, spend time meeting and worshiping God, trusting Him to meet our needs, and we would then cross the border at noon and we would go into East Berlin and we would go to Alexander Platz and as far as you could see to the north, the east, the south and the west was nothing but one solid massive group of young people and we said Lord how are we going to do this <laughs> Lord they, they'll arrest us the minute we begin to talk about Jesus how are we going to do this and we walked around, we just walked around praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we, we long to see a display of your kingdom, of your power, and of your glory. And as we walked around, some young people came up to us, and they could tell we were Americans because of our dress. And they wore these little neckerchiefs, and, and, and they, they would give us their pen, and they said, could we have your autograph? And so we had all memorized this little gospel pamphlet, The Four Spiritual Laws in German. We'd all memorized it in German. So Fred would write, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and sign his name. 
And then the other friend would write, but man is sinful and separated from God and sign his name. And I would write, but Jesus Christ is God's provision for our sin. And I would sign my name and I would say, you need to receive Jesus. And all of a sudden, young people begin to flood around us and ask us for autographs. And we just begin to write the gospel on the, on the scarves of all these young people. And then I finally had enough courage and I told Fred and Fred, I said, stand back, I'm going to preach. And I started preaching as fast and as loud as I could and the crowd got so large that Fred and Fred went to the, the outside of the, of the crowd and they began to preach in English and someone began to translate for them. And we preached. And there was something I didn't know. There was something I didn't know. There was a pastor in a little village called Gross Hartmannsdorf in East Germany that had started a Bible study and no one came for young people. Young people had left the church in mass, and he started a Bible study for these young people. No one came. So he and another guy prayed every uh, one night a week for, for a year for the kingdom and the glory and the power of God to be displayed among the German youth. And then after a year of praying, he started the Bible study again. They had 60 young people show up. It grew to 100, to 200, to 500, to 1,000. Finally, they had to start meeting in five cities, filling these huge cathedrals with young people longing to hear about Jesus. And he told the young people, and this is a crazy thing for him to tell them. He said, you go to East Berlin, the Communist Youth World Festival, and you ask God to send some Jesus people there that you can meet. And they were walking around Alexander Plotz looking for some followers of Jesus and Fred and Fred and I show up preaching Jesus and I want to tell you what I don't have time to go into it because I'm going to close here but we saw the glory of God the last night of the Communist Youth World Festival 200 hardcore atheist young people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ said, let's have a Jesus march. And right in the middle of the Communist Youth World Festival, we held a Jesus march. They sent in a thousand young people to break up our march. And instead of breaking it up, they got on the tail end. It looked like 1,200 of us. And people began to run and yell, the Jesus people are coming, the Jesus people are coming, the Jesus people are coming. Finally, they backed us into a corner, and I stood and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to thousands of atheist young people. And we saw the glory of God. We saw the power of God. We saw the kingdom of God. I have to be honest, it wasn't easy because they began to beat us. And whenever they began to hit us, the joy and the presence of the Spirit of God flooded Alexander Potts. And the key issue at Alexander Potts became who is Jesus Christ on the last night of the Communist Youth World Festival. So I want to close with two things quickly. First, I want to show you the final video that we put together. And this final video is from the last three phrases. This is the last phrase. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This one is from yours is the glory. And you'll discover that the glory of God may not be found where you think it is. So right now, let's listen to this video and then I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. When Jesus taught his disciples to commune with the Father, his ultimate aim was the glory of God 
the focus of all true prayer is the exaltation of our Father in heaven. We're given the wonderful privilege of joining with all of creation to declare His glory. Mountains reveal His grandeur, rivers proclaim His swift and mighty power, and the heavens display His magnificence. And God gives you and me the opportunity to see the manifestation of His glory. True prayer originates with Him and is directed to Him and is ultimately for Him, for the display of His majesty, that the world might see His glory. Is there any real possibility that our prayers can enable us to experience the manifestation of His glory? The scriptures teach that there's one place to find hope for the demonstration of the glory of God. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus living in you and me by His Spirit is the hope of the manifestation of His glory. It's when we come to Jesus with the circumstances of our lives and ask Him to take control of those situations by His Spirit, that's when we see the display of His glory. It's then that we are conformed into the image of Christ. In His presence, we are revived. Thirsty hearts are flooded with living water. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and climb dangerous mountain paths, our heart cry must be, show me your glory, O Lord. Manifest yourself, O Jesus, that I might see your glory. It may sound strange, but I experienced the greatest revival of my life when I was diagnosed with cancer 13 years ago. I didn't know whether I would live or die, but a prayer began to rise in my heart. Whether it is by death or by life, Jesus be exalted. I long for your glory. After surgery, I couldn't travel for three months. I was weak, powerless. I couldn't do what God had called me to do. And during those days, I determined to seek God as I had never sought Him. I spent hours reading the Bible and worshiping Jesus. One night I had a dream and I heard words echoing, wounded deer, wounded deer. Those words kept reverberating in my heart all the next day, wounded deer, wounded deer. I asked the Lord, what is this wounded deer? What does it mean? He reminded me of Psalm 42 and verse 1. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. I wept. Yes, I am but a wounded deer. You are my only hope. I must go to the waters every day and drink from the river that flows from your throne. The hope of glory is Christ living in me and oh the refreshing from heaven that flooded my heart that day my focus in prayer was forever changed I set my sight on the hope that is found in Jesus he is the radiance of God's glory he is the exact representation of the nature and character of God he loved as no one ever loved he lived as no one ever lived he is the light of the world and his life radiates the effulgence of the glory of God when our hearts cry for his glory his spirit shows the splendor of God's character in our worst circumstances. He displays the brilliance of God's light in the valleys and on the mountaintops. As we seek our Father in heaven, we will discover His glory in everyday circumstances of our lives, and we will pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory forever amen let's stand together and i want you just to repeat after me and we're going to pray that prayer but i want you to pray it from your heart and then i'm going to ask maybe the prayer partners can come on down here right now the prayer partners be here and then we'll close and if god's touched your heart and you just want to pray with someone today you come down here and pray with one of our prayer partners but let's let's pray together repeat after me but just repeat it from your whole heart our father in heaven Hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I look to you, Jehovah Jireh, to meet every need. Forgive me of my debts where I failed you. And give me the grace to forgive others. Even as I have been forgiven, Oh, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 I want you to go home and spend some time in prayer. If you need to pray with someone here, we're going to put up uh, on the screen the, if you would like to be a part of this movement. I'm praying that God will just uh, send a revival. We need a revival. We need to see the glory. What we need is the glory of God. So you pray for that. And, and God bless you. You're dismissed. You can Go ahead at home or you can come and pray. If you need to pray with someone, we're, we're here. God bless you.